Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, it is 11 o'clock. We wanted to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, if you're in southeastern Michigan, you'll notice we are apparently done with winter, moving right into spring, although I suspect we will be in for what I like to call second winter uh, <laughs> anytime in March. But we appreciate you taking time out of your, uh, your schedules to join us. Uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit about cybercrime and cryptocurrency. We're uh, very excited to have Caitlin Kiska, who is one of our cybersecurity analysts, uh, in the Healthcare Security Operations Center here in Plymouth. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to her. If you missed, we kind of just made this announcement, but I see more people have joined since then. Um, if you have a question or you have a comment, please feel free to throw that into the chat or into the questions bar. Uh, and I'll do my best to moderate it through to Caitlin. Um, and we'll get that stuff answered for you and we'll get going. So without further ado, once again, thanks for coming. Caitlin, take it away. Hey everyone, um, so welcome first of all to our webinar. This is something I'm incredibly passionate about and today we're gonna be talking about how cryptocurrency drives the threat landscape and really how it affects us at the end of the day as security professionals. So who am I? Uh, my name is Caitlin Kiska. I, as Karen just said, I'm an analyst with Cyberforce Q. We're based out of Plymouth, Michigan, but I'm specifically on the HSOC team, the healthcare SOC. This means that I identify, analyze, and help track threats associated specifically with the healthcare industry. I also help build out, or I'm helping build out our threat intelligence capabilities, which is something I'm really excited and proud about. And uh, in my spare time, because we all do things in our spare time, it's important to know that about people. <laughs> I like to bird watch, cook, and drink wine. And if I had it my way, I could do all three of these things at the same time. So what are we doing here today? Today, we're gonna to discuss how cryptocurrency drives the threat landscape and how it can increase crypto mining attacks and also how it can help and hinder ransomware attacks. A lot of people don't know that it can hinder it as well. We're gonna talk about how the rise in cryptocurrency value changes the cybercrime ecosystem and the different attack surfaces. And lastly, we're gonna talk about how cryptocurrency wallet addresses are a high fidelity method of attribution. That's a way of pinpointing who did something. And these are being used by law enforcement to track threat actors. And this last bullet point is super, super exciting. Attribution in cybersecurity, so again, pinpointing who actually did something, it's extremely hard and it's something that usually is next to impossible. For a really long time, these have been nameless and faceless crimes. And it's been, as I said, almost impossible to even associate things with a group. That's why when you see the news, they'll attribute things to different group names, because it's even hard enough just to do that. But cryptocurrency tracking allows us to actually pinpoint individuals behind certain attacks, which we're gonna discuss soon. And this is a really positive thing for our space, which I'm excited to share. So full disclosure. Uh, cryptocurrency is an extremely complicated topic. Uh, this is a, webin a webinar specifically for security professionals, and I've broken down a lot of the different terms and concepts to a really nice kind of happy medium where I hope everyone can understand them. I'm gonna put several Easter eggs as well throughout this presentation as a bit of a reward for everyone for sticking with me. And how this will work is the first person to correctly name who or what the Easter egg is, again, I'm gonna explicitly reference them, will get a prize. Um, but Throw it also, into the chat, I think, yeah. so that's how we're yes. going to do it, and I'll yes. track it. And yeah, and Karen tracks it, and then she sends you a prize afterwards, <laughs> which we all like prizes and free, th free things, so I'm excited for that as well, um, particularly the, my last one I'm very excited about. But um, So cryptocurrency, it's also a really, really controversial topic. It's something people argue about all the time, whether it's real, not real, whether it has value. Um, and we recognize that you can't really talk about cryptocurrency without talking about the financial system or privacy. I get that. But today, because this is a webinar for security professionals, as you can see from my extremely thorough graph I've made on the right-hand side, where we are gonna live today, where our little home will be, is between the intersection between cryptocurrency and cybersecurity. And we're gonna, I'm gonna try really hard not to steer us off in either one direction. We wanna live right in the middle of where these two things intersect. So what are we talking about today? At the end of the day, we are here to talk about money cash, clams, dough, De Niro, whatever kind of nomenclature you want to use. Money makes the world go round. And the recent, very well publicized solar winds attack aside, it's still the most prevalent motivator for the vast majority of attacks we are seeing. Money has always been a motivation for crime. Cybercrime and cryptocurrency are just putting it in a new wrapping paper. They're putting it in a more modern package. So just a quick kind of introduction to this. What is cryptocurrency? It is simply a digital medium of exchange. 
for this webinar, we don't need to know all the intricacies. We don't need to know all the technical details. Don't feel bad if you don't have a, a technical understanding of this. The vast majority of people do not. All you need to know for right now is cryptocurrency is a digital medium of exchange. Because cryptocurrency is seen as reliable, the transactions are irreversible, and there is a perceived, whether that's correct, a perceived degree of anonymity. It is used for the default payment method for vict victim to criminal payments, like in ransomware attacks, but also criminal to criminal payments, which kind of fuels the cybercrime ecosystem as a whole, which we're going to go into in a little bit. And since the method for people, for the methods of payment people want, whether that's for selling access to a system or for a ransomware attack, is cryptocurrency, that's what we're here to talk about today. And in the 2020 State of a Data Breach report, they came out and said, this is by Verizon, it's an excellent report if you've never read it, 86% of attacks are financially motivated, 86% of attacks. And in order to fully understand that threat, uh, the threat landscape most orga organizations face, we need to fo focus on these financially motivated actors. And as I said earlier, I work specifically um, looking at threats in the healthcare industry. 88% of attacks targeting the healthcare industry are financially motivated. And because most of the attacks we see are financially motivated, this is why our industry needs to take cryptocurrency seriously. Cryptocurrency isn't just something to argue about on Twitter or Thanksgiving dinner. If you are in our industry, it deeply affects every aspect of our jobs, and that's what I'm here to explain to you today. And a lot of the conversations in our industry or among people are about the validity of cryptocurrency. Again, is it real? Is it something, is it worth all this money, et cetera, et cetera, as opposed to how it affects our jobs. And as an industry, we need to follow its value, how it's governed and how it's exchanged in order to best protect our organizations. And one of my main motivations today as well is to get people to realize that their personal opinions, what you think or know about cryptocurrency is actually irrelevant. You could be like the CEO of JP Morgan Chase and believe that Bitcoin is a fraud. Or first Easter egg, you could be like these two gentlemen in the upper right hand corner and think that Bitcoin is going to revolutionize the financial system. At the end of the day, it really does not matter. It does not change the fact that the cryptocurrency is a viable medium of exchange that is used across the cybercrime ecosystem. And these are different social media pictures from members of what the FBI has dubbed Evil Corp. Uh, the FBI has came out and said they are wanted for stealing over $100 million from different U.S. companies and are associated with distri distributed, uh, distributing excuse me, multiple different ransomware strains. Uh, there's actually a $5 million bounty on the heads of multiple people in this group that's offered by the FBI. And your personal opinion about cryptocurrency does not change that the people who are working against us are using it to pay for, as we can see here, what's obviously an extremely expensive wedding, or buy supercars, or fly to Dubai and pose with wads of cash on Instagram, or whatever chuckleheads want to do. If the people who are attacking our networks care about cryptocurrency and are, use it, are using it to profit off of pwning and owning our networks, we need to care about it too. And let's see, whoops. Cryptocurrency is deeply intertwined in mul multiple facets of the cybercrime ecosystem. It's used as payment and ransomware attacks. It's used to buy and sell access to infected systems, accounts, hosts, and even people's passwords, which we're gonna get into a bit. It's the main motivator for increasingly common crypto mining attacks, which a lot of people don't even know that they need to be looking for. It's payment for zero days exploits and bulletproof hosting. And it's also um, something that our end users, whether they're at home or they're working, are seeing uh, in smaller threats to them on a daily basis, which we'll discuss in a minute. And I really wanted to go over this as well, just to show that no matter whether you are an individual, whether you work for a small organization or a large organization, there is some, some bullet point on this list that has somehow affected you personally at your job or someone you know, and we're going to discuss uh, how in the next couple slides. So this is something we wanted to start kind of small here on the smallest level and talk about how cryptocurrency affects the threats our users see at work and at home in their inboxes. This is a sextortion campaign that hit millions upon millions of users during COVID-19. It actually got so big that they stopped tracking at like 5 million, um, 5 million people that it reached. It's really hard to track. It was sent to both uh, people at their homes and people at work. And basically the whole idea behind an extor a sextortion attack is they are emailing saying, we caught you doing something naughty. 
uh, unless you send us Bitcoin and they give you the address how and explain to you how they want you to do that, we're going to release everything on the internet. Uh, what made a lot of this scary is they actually bought um, exposed and leaked passwords that people had online. And so they would include in the subject line someone's old password that they had found online. So a lot of people thought that this was legitimate. And this is an example of how we're seeing cryptocurrency just be kind of woven into these daily threats our users are seeing. Another one we're seeing on a really regular basis is how cryptocurrency works in social engineering campaigns. And social engineering at the end of the day, um, in this context, it's just someone trying to get you to send them money under false pretenses. Very old scam, just in new wrapping paper again. All they want you to do is send them money under false pretenses, which they have made up. And on the right hand side here, this is something we're seeing a lot of, uh, there'll be an email that says your PayPal account or credit card or whatever have, have you say, has been used to buy $700 in Bitcoin. Uh, through Coinbase. Coinbase is one of the biggest exchanges in the United States. And in order to reverse the transaction, you have to call a phone number and that's when they try to get more money out of you. And we're seeing this on a huge daily basis. We're also seeing a lot of different emails um, asking users to kind of participate in Ponzi-like schemes saying, oh, pay money so we can tell you how to invest in Bitcoin and make some money as well. The those are kind of smaller threats that our users are seeing on a day-to-day -day basis, which you could maybe say aren't necessarily something we should even be considering at an enterprise level, right? These are kind of individual things. They might not affect the organization as a whole. But one thing that cryptocurrency definitely did affect was um, how it works with ransomware. 2020 was by far the most prolific year of ransomware attacks we have seen. It set an intensely disturbing trend within our industry. And as humans, by our very nature, most of us, what we tend to do is look at the worst case scenario and think this is going to be highly, highly improbable. Um, I think anyone in the industry will tell you the worst case scenario would most likely be ransomware. And 2020 saw ransomware attacks be brought to the mainstream in an intensely realistic way, no matter what industry you were in. Um, this is a graph by Chainalysis. I'm going to reference their reporting multiple times throughout this, um, and they specifically track illicit cryptocurrency funds um, across the globe. They do great reporting on this. And what they found out is that in 2020, roughly 350 million in ransomware payments were made. 350 million. This is over a 300% increase from last year. And one thing that's incredibly important to note is they even come out and say this in their reporting. This is an understatement. So there's still people who won't disclose that they've been the victim of a ransomware attack. So what's already a very large number that $350 million was paid out last year, in reality is much, much larger. And this leads us to our next kind of topic in this, which is RAS, which is ransomware as a service. Uh, 2020 was the year that ransomware as a service really came to a forefront and it was something we really needed to pay attention to. Basically, it's a business model where ransomware developers will lease or sell their software to affiliates that perform the initial access and attack. And then what they'll do from there is they'll split up the different profits between the developer and the people who have actually done the network intrusion and actually deployed the software. If we look on the right, these are the top 20 ransomware strains uh, by revenue in 2020. Almost all of these are ransomware as a service and use this business model. Like, so Nokabi, Ryuk, Maze, Netwalker, all of these are different ransomware as a service uh, strains. And as I said, cryptocurrency both helps and hinders ransomware as a service. So yes, cryptocurrency makes ease of payment and ransomware attacks easier. Uh, historically, there's some really interesting information about this. Uh, previously, there was an example where people wanted gift cards to be sent. There was another example where someone wanted you to write them a check and mail it to Panama. But in order for this to scale, a different uh, method of payment needed to be used. And cryptocurrency was actually very uniquely suited for this. Europe, Europol has noted that, again, there's this perceived irreversibility of the transaction, which is true. Uh, it's very easy to access. By the end of this webinar, you could most likely at least get on your way to buying some kind of, kind of cryptocurrency if you wanted. And this perceived anonymity, all these little ingredients work together to make this uniquely suitable for ransomware. And it also makes it possible for ransomware as a service to exist. Um, obviously, there'd be a lot more issues if you couldn't transfer the funds quickly to others over a virtual medium simply by knowing something called a wallet address. It gives it that anonymity. And I want you to imagine every single bank heist movie you've ever seen where like the people meet together in a garage to exchange the cash and something goes wrong. 
obviously if you couldn't do this with cryptocurrency and you had to like physically meet with the people to split the proceeds of your crime this wouldn't be a very clean or viable way of doing business but so while it has given a rise to ransomware and made it a prevalent threat it also makes it easy to track transactions with a high level of fidelity and in the last year this has led to the arrest of multiple different ransomware affiliates and this is something i'm really excited to talk about so in order to understand this again we are going to have two or three kind of technical things here and i promise you we're going to get through them kind of hopefully quickly and as painlessly as possible because today we are not here to go into a large discussion of the technical details of cryptocurrency but in able to be able to understand how we track illicit activity we need to at least know what something is what something called a blockchain is and bitcoin uses blockchain technology and blockchain a blockchain at the end of the day is a public ledger and as a rule of thumb, it contains every transaction ever made for a particular cryptocurrency. And while you can kind of obscure some of the transactions and everything like that, as a general rule, any transaction made in Bitcoin can be traced across the blockchain. And that's how uh, different ransomware actors and members of the cybercrime ecosystem are being tracked down and arrested. And despite the fact that Bitcoin payments are fairly easily traceable, it still remains the dominant cryptocurrency for payments associated with illicit services. So again, as long as someone is asking for payment in Bitcoin or um, paying in Bitcoin, as a rule of thumb, there is a way to track them. And how this was put into action was actually last month. And this is a perfect example of this. This was, uh, NetWalker is a ransomware as a service strain. And in January of 2021, uh, excuse me, I'm not Quebecois, so I'm going to butcher this name. Sebastian Vachon de Serin, oh, that was close, but I'm not quite there. He was arrested on receiving $27 million. $27 million, actually very important to note, in a pretty short time, I think like two years, $27 million worth of Bitcoin associated with ransomware attacks. And he was actively perpetrating ransomware attacks on healthcare organizations during the COVID-19 pandemic, which in my opinion makes him a particular kind of disgusting. But he was specifically arrested as the product of blockchain-based investigations, showing that he received these different funds associated with ransomware attacks that were perpetrated. And one of the things that this man illustrates, and I'm not being cheeky here, this is literally the only picture of him I could find online that was public, but he shows that ransomware, it's not a nameless or a faceless crime. It's perpetrated by people. And in this case, it was a man living in Gatineau, Ottawa, which isn't even the fourth biggest city in Canada. It's the fourth biggest city in Ottawa. And he was charged and arrested again by receiving $27 million worth of cryptocurrency for ransomware attacks. When he was with the, the NetWalker ransomware gang, he was sometimes earning up to 80% of ransom for his attacks. And he was also an affiliate with the Sodenokabe and Ragnar Locker strains. This is important to notice because a lot of people, it's been a suspicion for a long time, there's actually a smaller group of people who are perpetrating these attacks than previously thought. They think there's just a, a certain uh, smaller number of, again, individuals like this man here who was on vacation. Um, I think, I hope he doesn't walk around Canada like that, but, um, there's a smaller amount of people who are actually perpetrating these. They're just working for multiple different strains. But what's really important to us in our space is that this illustrates that the government actually views this blockchain-based tracking, the receipt of these illicitly gained cryptocurrency funds to be a high value source of attribution. They think this can hold up in court. They think they can prosecute this man and that a jury will hopefully prosecute him and find him guilty. And cybercrime, this brings us to kind of back to what we keep saying this whole time, cybercrime is just crime in an updated package. And throughout history, the majority of crimes have been financially motivated. Cryptocurrency and cybercrime, it's just in a different package, something newer and a little more technological. And in traditional crimes and investigations, we would tell investigators to follow the money. And this is no different. And we are in a really wonderful positive place in this space right now because as long as people are using bitcoin we can track them and we can follow the money just like in traditional investigations to its source and see who these people are and money laundering it's not a new or novel concept the people who are getting paid in bitcoin what they are trying to do is at the end of the day they need to get their funds out of cryptocurrency they want to cash it out and be able to put it in the bank and spend it save it whatever people want to do uh, 
if the majority of threat actors are financially motivated, we need to make it hard for them to profit off their illicit activities, whether it's as defenders making uh, hardening our networks, or again, at the law enforcement side, making it hard for people to actually cash out this money. And we need to be able to impede their goal. And the ability for investigators to follow the money, there are different products that can obscure and kind of make it a little trickier. Uh, but talking about the technical pieces of this is kind of outside the scope of our discussion today. But one of the things that I did want to give a positive call out to is the United States government has actually been arresting people associated with these different products that try to launder the money for several years. Uh, the government has arrested several people who run mixing services. This tries to obscure things on the blockchain, stuff like that. So also positive movement in that space as well. And chain analysis reports that and we need to kind of keep in mind that this is globally, a small group of 270 different blockchain addresses have laundered around 55% of cryptocurrency associated with criminal activity. And this doesn't just include ransomware or malware and stuff like this. This also includes drugs, child porn, really disgusting stuff. And they found again, 270 different addresses are laundering 55% of this. And what this shows is that by going after a limited number of bad actors associated with laundering, uh, law enforcement can hopefully have an outsized effort on the cybercrime ecosystem as a whole. If there's just 270 addresses, taking down just a couple of people could hopefully have a really outside positive effect. And one of the things I really do believe is that we not shouldn't just be prosecuting and hunting the people who are attacking our networks. We need to be looking at the money launderers themselves. And this is incredibly important if we want to keep our space safe as a whole. And so why Bitcoin? We know that it can be tracked. We know that we can track the Bitcoin receipt someone paid for a ransomware attack in Florida to a random man sitting in Gatineau, Ottawa. Why would people still use this? Um, it doesn't even, to me, it, it kind of doesn't even make that much sense. The whole thing, though, is that ransomware attackers, they want their victims to be able to pay quickly and as quickly and easily and painlessly as possible. And also, Bitcoin has the advantage of ease of adoption. Everyone kind of knows what it is. There's multiple other things called privacy coins, which we'll get into in a second, which would make it either difficult or if not possible to be able to track this movement on the chain. Again, with Bitcoin, we can see it on this chain, but people aren't asking for these privacy coins. Uh, in a lot of different countries, um, these privacy coins are actually illegal. So you can't buy them legitimately on an open market like you can with Bitcoin. Uh, so something important to know about this is as long as people are requesting and asking for uh, requesting Bitcoin payments and people are making it, this provides us an opportunity as blue team defenders, investigators and government agencies to actually be able to track these people down. And again, for a really long time, we couldn't even we had a hard time even attributing certain uh, activity to groups, you know. One more quick example of this, this was also um, multiple different uh, affiliates associated with the Egregor ransomware strain. This was in Europe. This was a multi-country kind of operation between the French and the Ukrainians. They up, uh, ended up arresting multiple different affiliates associated with the Egregor ransomware strain after France was hit particularly hard and multiple uh, huge, huge corporations were taken down by ransomware. And they came out and said just very uh, verbatim, point blank, how they did this was following the money on the chain to track the flow of Bitcoins being handled by the suspects. So this is something we're seeing play out in real time, these people getting arrested. And on the right hand side, this is the amount of times different cryptocurrencies are mentioned on illicit dark web forms as the kind of cryptocurrency they want payment for. And as we can see, people are still asking for Bitcoin. We have people asking for something called Monero next and a couple different things here, also Zcash. And we do see a movement as a whole towards people asking for more privacy coins, but it's not a large movement. And this is something that we actually need to watch as an industry, because if we ever do see people start asking for more privacy coins and things that we can't track, that's gonna be bad news for us because again, we won't be able to do any kind of attribution. So one of the things that's really important for me today is for you to look at a headline associated with cryptocurrency, no matter how much or how little you understand, whatever the technical pieces are, and be able to say, okay, how does this affect my job and my organization? And one of the big things that we all really need to pay attention to is privacy coins. 
um, I'm going to just do a kind of quick explainer about what a privacy coin is. It's a unique cryptocurrency and it provides, again, a level of anonymity with blockchain transactions. So with Bitcoin, we can see it across the chain. With privacy coins, many times we can't. So sometimes the transaction ballot, uh, balance or the wallet address will be private. And there's multiple different kinds like Monero, Zcash, and Dash. If we ever see if a headline that says the United States has made uh, Monero illegal or something like that, that would be something we really would need to pay attention to, again, as an industry. That, so this is something we need to keep our eye on no matter our level of understanding. But So Monero is not just being asked for as payment for illicit services on the dark web. It's also a motivator behind network intrusions, which we will go to into in our next slides. So in January of 2021, the DFI report documented an elaborate attack that resulted in the installation of something called an XM rig coin miner. And this came out with them writing a really wonderful report that was called All That for a Coin Miner. And if you're in cybersecurity, if you do operations, this next piece should scare the pants off you. So what happened is a threat actor brute forced a local admin password using RDP. They dumped the credentials using Mimikatz. They exported all the Kerberos tickets. They enumerated the, the system, so like looked around, saw everything that was on the networks using something called Advanced IP Scanner, and then they RDP'd into multiple systems, including a domain controller. Once they actually had access to the domain controller, what they actually did was they installed something called the XM Rig Coin Miner. Um, this could be a lot, a lot worse. This isn't exactly, but it's very similar to what we would see um, when ransomware is actually deployed. But what they ended up doing was installing a coin miner, and this led to the name of the report, again, all that for a coin miner. And yes, when the price of Monero has gone up that much, it has gone up over 200, and roughly 240% in the last year, people are gonna do all that for a coin miner. And instead of maybe distributing ransomware or making that part of a botnet or something, they're just gonna install a coin miner instead. And as the, the value of cryptocurrency is rising, there has been as a whole a trend towards seeing more crypto mining based attacks. Uh, this is uh, the chart for Bitcoin on the right hand side. I'm sure again, people hear about this in the news. They see it, they see it everywhere. The price of Bitcoin in the last year is up roughly 450%. And Avira Labs, there's actually, this coin mining attacks are very underreported as a whole. But so Avira Labs has documented just between Q3 and Q4, and this is really when there was a huge spike in Bitcoin, there was a 53% uh, increase in coin mining attacks across the board. And this happened as cryptocurrency prices were going through the roof. And so this is something we can kind of look at as well and see the, how the trends would work is as the price of Bitcoin goes up or different cryptocurrencies, Monero, Bitcoin, what have you, people are going to be switching their attacks to coin mining attacks because it's very profitable for them. And this leads us to our second Easter egg. If you could name this famous miner on the right and what movie he's in. Um, we kind of, again, brief explainer here. Uh, I promise that I'm going to try to make this as quick and painless as possible. As I said, what is crypto mining? What is sometimes it's called crypto jacking is uh, when someone uses your system to mine different kinds of cryptocurrency for themselves. So crypto jacking is the unauthorized usage of another system to mine cryptocurrency. And each time a cryptocurrency transaction is made, a miner is responsible for ensuring the authenticity of the information and updating the blockchain. Again, that's why we can all see everything in the blockchain because it's being updated by the miners. And the mining process itself involves, uh, they're competing with other miners and the first one to solve a very complicated math problem is rewarded with a little bit of cryptocurrency. And in order for this to scale and be profitable, we're seeing the rise of huge, gigantic crypto mining botnets that have been really they're being found across the globe. Uh, a couple different examples here. Uh, one was called TM Team TNT. One was called Rock. A uh, big shout out to Marty from Innova who told me about that one. And this other one here is very interesting. It's called the Volgar botnet. And again, to make this profitable, this has to happen at a huge, huge scale. And this last one at its peak before it was dismantled was infecting two to 3,000 servers a day. Two to 3,000 servers a day before it was dismantled. And so, but it's something that's important to kind of call out because this is really where we start seeing our attack surface change. Not only is there a rise of crypto mining based attacks, the hardware and software people target for crypto mining, it actually changes what we need to focus on. And 
Crypto mining attacks often target AWS instances, uh, Kubernetes, Docker instances, things like that. These are all newer technologies. They're not technologies people work with a lot. And so securing them is something that people find harder because simply we just don't work with them all the time. And also endpoint protection products for Linux and cloud-based hosts, these are the things that are being targeted in crypto mining attacks, they're often lacking. And that's its own webinar on its own that these are not complete products, but how this actually affects us is at the end of the day, it turns hunting for cryptocurrency miners into a manual task. And oftentimes teams just don't have the bandwidth to do it. Um, it relies heavily on looking at baselines. You have to have an extreme amount of network familiarity a lot of times. It's extremely, extremely manual, so it changes how we identify threats in our uh, network as well. One of the really interesting pros of this, because again, it, we're now looking over here, but it actually benefits us in some manners as well. Um, there is a really interesting report that's been done by Kaspersky, and this talks about their, how there's an inverse relationship between cryptocurrency mining and DDoS attacks. And basically what happens is, again, people will have endpoints in these large botnets. As cryptocurrency mining becomes more profitable, they will shift their resources that they are, um, you know, stealing from you. They've they've infected your machines. They uh, will shift their resources towards cryptocurrency mining as opposed to using them in DDoS attacks. So why does this matter? Um, and this kind of brings us to a big overarching discussion. It's one of the main questions I wanted to pose today was how much of a threat are crypto miners to your organizations? And a lot of security professionals really view these as low level threats. And I was having a full disclosure, a completely hypothetical discussion with someone about this, about if we should view them as high or low level threats. And he looked at me and he's like, Caitlin, why would I care that much if someone used something in my network to basically do math problems? Because at like a very high level, high level, they're, they're using your software to do math problems. Um, and this gets into a big discussion because there are a lot of reasons that you should care. So one of the things here is that there's an actual financial cost associated with others abusing your resources for mining. Very literally, the reason the person has intruded into your network is because they don't want to pay the financial cost for mining themselves, and they've instead decided that you are going to pay for it. Also, the DFIR case shows that attackers will compromise an entire network for the sake of crypto mining. These attacks are becoming increasingly common as the value of cryptocurrency goes up. And access to assets, networks, accounts, you name it, are frequently resold on the dark web, as we'll discuss in our next slide. And there are entire in networks and individuals who specialize in this. And because the vast majority of attackers are financially motivated, we have to assume that when something becomes of less value, or of no value to them, they're not just gonna say, oh, well, okay, we're done for the day. We're just gonna close this and I'm gonna go home. They're gonna resell it. And that whole kind of network and infrastructure is there so it can be resold easily. This brings us to our next case study, which I'm lovingly gonna call the garbage men. Um, one of my favorite researchers in this space is, uh, his name is Benoit Ensel. And again, pardon me, I am not French, so I probably, much like the earlier one, I had trouble with, um, but he, in this, post here, he went into a really wonderful in-depth discussion about something called loads reselling, which is the practice of bulk reselling access to infected machines. And again, this is a huge part of the cybercrime ecosystem. And there's people who distribute exploit kits, uh, people who distribute mail spam, just like kind of blast out malware to a whole bunch of people, or people who do pay per install something a little bit more custom. And they're all active in the practice of reselling access to machines. And of course, this payment is made in uh, cryptocurrency. And this is something we do need to pay attention to just so we remember that this isn't just someone who's simply doing a math, who's installed software to do math problems on your network. At the end of the day, this can be bought and resold. It's incredibly profitable and the infrastructure is there. And in addition to just reselling the access, sometimes there can be much, much larger um, and very hard to fathom consequences. And such is the case, the case with Paige Thompson. This was the hacker and insider threat associated with the Capital One breach. A lot of times this actually gets overlooked, but Ta Paige Thompson, her, um, so her screen name was erratic. Paige Thompson was initially using the access to the systems that she had for Monero crypto mining. And again, her screen name was erratic you, with good reason in this case, who could have guessed that this would happen. But what happened is, again, with this actual initial, initial access because of crypto mining, there was a huge breach for Capital One. It uh, jeopardized the information of 100, 100 million US customers and 6 million Canadian customers. And estimates put the cost of the breach at roughly $300 million. And 
this really just goes to show you don't know what someone's going to do once they have that access in your network. And so these are huge numbers, right? 300 million for the Capital One attack, 350 million associated with ransomware last year. These are huge numbers. But research from Chainalysis shows that overall, illicit activity associated with cryptocurrency transactions is roughly 1% of all transactions across the globe. Uh, it might be a little bit higher because again, they, they fully call out that they can underestimate some things, but from what they are seeing, it's 1% overall. But obviously, because we are in cybersecurity, even $1 of that that comes at the expense of our organizations we are trying to protect is too much. So where does that bring us today? While illicit cybersecurity transactions are only kind of the small aspect of transitions, uh, transactions as a whole, it's a glue that holds a lot of the cybercrime ecosystem together. And we do need to look at this as an ecosystem. It's used for the victim to criminal payments for ransomware. It's used for the transaction uh, transactions associated with illicit services. So again, reselling access. It's used to buy the different passwords that were used in sextortion campaigns that hit a whole bunch of different users. And we have to pay attention to it because the people who were, are working against us to attack us and intrude to our networks, they are paying attention to it. And we need to know that it's a piece of the puzzle, but not the puzzle on its on its you know in its totality. It's not the puzzle as it, as its whole. But because it is a piece, we do need to be able to pay attention to it so we can see the whole picture. And this kind of brings us to putting it all together. The next time you see a headline about cryptocurrency prices booming or plummeting or what have you, don't think about whether or not you think cryptocurrency is real or fake or like an argument you got into with someone over Thanksgiving or like if you're missing out on making money, whatever. What we need to think about is how this affects our organizations. So if the value of cryptocurrency is going to continue to rise, does this mean there's going to be more coin miners? If it continues to rise, does this mean there are going to be less DDoS attacks? Uh, by following the trends of the value of crypt cryptocurrency, we can kind of see where we need to be putting our resources, what we might need to be securing, uh, because again, as the value of cryptocurrency goes up, we can kind of assume the uh, amount of coin miners are going to go up as well. And one of the things too is this leads us to making sure that as cybersecurity professionals, we are discussing whether or not these things are serious threats to our organization in a professional level. You don't want to actually have an incident associated with this before you have to sit and think, oh how do we actually view coin miners as an organization or is this something my team takes seriously so we do need to recognize that this is something people are talking about it's something that's active in the cybercrime ecosystem and this because of that we need to pay attention to it as a team and we really do at the end of the day this is something that's becoming more prevalent we need to be focused on the familiar and realistic threats that are attacking our organizations and these aren't apts as most industries are heavily targeted by financially motivated threat actors, we need to be familiar with their tactics, techniques, and protocols. And we need to be able, familiar with how we can prevent them from achieving their goal, whether that's making sure they can't deploy commodity malware on our networks or doing something more larger and strategic and trying to make sure they can't actually make money off owning and owning our networks. And at the end of the day, I love this quote from Europol and I think it really sums up what we're doing as a whole. Cybercrime is an evolution. It's not a revolution. The fundamentals of cybercrime stay the same. It's not that much different from other forms of traditional crimes. And so by taking advantage of the fact that people are paying in Bitcoin and we can track it, we can track the money just like you would with any traditional crime. And my last little kind of bullet point here is one of the things I wanted to share is that this is something we should be paying attention to. I provided a lot of different resources and good places to look if you are interested in this. This is something that someone on your team should kind of at least have an eye on and know that crypto miners are a threat and something like that. You can't ignore it as an organization. And so we really should be shining a light onto the different people who are providing us with these resources. And we're kind of coming into our last couple minutes here. And so I did want to give my final Easter egg for the road. This one is worth all the marbles. I will either give you a t-shirt or if you can guess who this is, people commonly refer to him and say, uh, we are all Satoshi Nakamoto, except for this man. If you can tell me who this man is, I'm either going to send you a t-shirt or the value of the t-shirt. Um, so that's my final Easter egg today. And I just wanted to say thank you very much for bearing with me. And hopefully you found some interesting uh, nuggets of information in here today. All right, thank you, Caitlin. And does anybody have any questions? I think, you know, one of the things when uh, Caitlin and I were going through this webinar and, you know, prepping it and getting it ready and stuff, uh, I learned a lot of, I didn't realize that 
yeah, uh, the, we were laughing because in the and this is maybe more proof that our phones are listening. But in the last almost week or two weeks, I was telling her that I got a um, uh, when I'm you know going through my own social media or watching a video on YouTube. Uh, there has been a, a definite increase in cryptocurrency ads um, telling me how easy it is and that I can just jump on and they'll give me uh, it's worth more than real money and they'll give me a uh, credit card that I can use and all this stuff. So it's definitely one of those things where perhaps timing, perhaps listening on my phone as Caitlin and I talked through some things, but, you know, definitely something that I, I didn't realize the relevancy and certainly the implications in a cybersecurity way where, um, you know, how is it being, how is it being utilized? It, it always kind of, to me felt like, uh, you know, kind of like a, a thing out in the world that like, I kind of didn't know about. So that was, uh, you know, an interesting thing as Caitlin kind of educated me on this, but, um, you know, does anybody have any questions? Uh, I see all the guesses, by the way, uh, in our question box. And uh, the nice thing about this is there's a little time stamp on them. So I know exactly who answered first. Um, and we will get those prizes out to you. I'm not going to let you know now, but check your email. Uh, you definitely, we will go out that direction. But um, does anybody have any questions? One of the things while uh, I do want to say while we um, just kind of see if anyone else has any questions, is I really do at the end of the day, and I think we've all been put in this position before, whether we like it or not, we are the tech support to our family and friends, and we are the ambassadors for cybersecurity. I get asked questions all the time from people I know about certain things, and is this a fish? Is this a scam? And so I think even again on a very micro level, it's important for us to know about these things. So if someone who you care about is like, oh, I got an email saying my account was used to buy Coinbase, should I call them? You can tell them no. <laughs> and I think, yeah, no, I'm serious. So it's important for us to be able to tell the people that we love things like this and that we are aware of these things, how they affect us on a micro level and a meta level as well. Absolutely. And when my family asks me, I will go ahead and give them your contact information to reach out <laughs> to. Um, that sounds great to me. So uh, I don't see any questions. Uh, we will go ahead and make this webinar available. It'll go up on our YouTube page. So, you know, if it's something that you want to reference or get back into, you certainly can. And we encourage you to share it with other people who maybe couldn't attend today. Um, but I think I'm going to be able to give us, uh, we're actually wrapping up right on time here. Um, of course, and Kaylin, I don't know if you can go to that last slide with our contact info. Oh, of course, yes. Um, but if anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out. I know sometimes these webinars and we talk here a lot about the fatigue that kind of comes with it. And sometimes your brain can't get the question going. So, oh, we do have one here uh, from Julian. Do you think Bitcoin will eventually be surpassed by other cryptos due to energy consumption differences? Since no one else is asking questions, I will go. I will slightly answer this. I do believe so Bitcoin uses something called proof of work. That's what uses the miners and stuff like that. Um, there's other cryptocurrencies that use something called proof of stake. I, If you are familiar with this, I do believe in proof of stake. I believe in the validity of proof of stake cryptocurrency as opposed to proof of work. Yes. So that to answer your question. Yes, I do think it will. So. Okay. Be surpassed. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Uh, I'm like, I'm not going to get technical. And I'm like, now I would shoehorn it in at the end. Well, uh, you know. Um, Anybody else? I did just right. want to say thank you to everyone for coming. It actually means a lot to me for everyone who came who uh, I know in a professional capacity or some, some people I went to school with. I just want to thank you all for coming. And this is something I obviously care about a lot and I'm really passionate about. And always feel free to reach out to me too if you see something that you think is interesting that fits again in this little home between cybersecurity and cryptocurrency. And yeah, send it to me. I would love it. So thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone for attending uh, and even those folks who don't know Caitlin but are getting to know us. We appreciate uh, you joining us this morning on this. And like I said, definitely part of uh, you know a series of webinars that we're doing to sort of help educate on different topics that maybe aren't talked about or maybe are talked about and maybe you're someone like me that is like, I know about half of what those words mean. So always great to kind of get into that space. Um, like I said, if you have any questions or think of anything afterward, please feel free to uh, reach out. You can also find us on our socials. They're all uh, at Cyberforce Q. So we hope to see you again um, next month. We always do it the Thursday of uh, the last Thursday of every month. So hopefully we'll see you next time. And 
follow those socials. We'll tell you the topic and who's presenting. Uh, but everybody have a great day and thank you again for joining us. Thank you.